Today's class will continue with what we've been doing in previous classes. We'll start off with reviewing the prior class. I always want to do that. Remember, our goal is not just to do well on exam. Our goal is for that you learn this permanently. This becomes part of your knowledge base forever and ever. And once we do the review of the prior class, we'll finish up stocks. We had U.S. versus non-U.S. to finish up some stocks. We did beta capitalization and style before we started U.S. versus non-U.S. before, but we'll finish that up. Then we'll do alternatives. And then we'll bring it all together for exam one, question one. And then I'll, I'll get you started on the second question on exam one, which is the tactical asset allocation question. So remember, this is the, the answer. We're almost We almost have the entire answer here. This is the outline. You define a portfolio, a collection of assets held for a future purpose, some future liabilities, some future cash outflow. In order to do that, you have to ask three questions. Why are you investing? What's your investment horizon? The second question is, in what can you invest? And that's your asset classes. And there we want to be parsimonious. You want to fully discuss what parsimonious means in your answer, including the term R squared. Make sure you understand what that means. And then the last question is, how are you going to do it? So we know why you're investing. We know what you can invest in. Now, how are you going to do it? Are you going to hire someone or do it yourself? Do you have a strategic allocation? Are you going to be tactical? Are you going to be active? Are you going to be passive? We'll talk a lot more about the how after the first exam. Then we got into the major asset classes, cash, bonds, stocks, and alternatives. We then start off contrasting cash versus bonds, the difference being reinvestment risk and price risk. Cash have high reinvestment risk but no price risk. Bonds have varying degrees of reinvestment and price risk depending on their duration. Then the, you get into the first asset class, cash and cash equivalents. There's no subcategories. It's the safest asset class but it, also, it has the lowest price risk but also has the lowest expected return. And you give some examples, T-bills, commercial paper, those type of things. Then we got into bonds. Bonds, we use DC cuts I. Remember, everything on DC cuts I, duration, convexity, credit, U.S. versus non-U.S., tax, structure, and inflation. On each one of those, you want the first to find it. What does it mean? Second, it'll give its category. On some, there's not many categories. Like with convexity, it's either positive convexity or negative convexity. Where structured debt, it's either structured debt or not structured debt. Most debt is not structured debt, but there's a lot of structured debt out there. Taxes, it's either taxable or tax exempt, like municipal bonds are tax exempt. So you get you get the subcategories, and then you talk about the strategy. Remember, just for an example, convexity. If you expect interest rates to become more volatile, you want to buy convexity, which means you want to buy bonds with positive convexity, avoid or reduce your allocation to bonds with negative convexity, such as mortgage-backed securities. And But if you're expecting interest rates to become more stable, you, you'd be willing to sell convexity, which means you're buying bonds with negative convexity, and you're picking up the higher starting yield, and you're willing to pick up that higher starting yield because you think the risk of losing it, that those bonds will be refinanced or be executed on their option is very low because you expect very stable interest rates. So you go through that entire DC cuts I, the fine, subcategories, and strategy. Same thing with stocks, the fine, subcategories, and strategy. But with stocks, you have an introduction on stocks, where you need to talk about stocks being the expected return on stocks being the current dividend yield plus the expected earnings growth. Expected earnings growth is very much tied to the economic growth. In fact, stock Earnings have not grown as fast as the economy, as we saw in that one chart. But there is a relationship. And so if you want to figure out how fast earnings or stocks are going to grow, then you'll, you'll want to know how fast can the economy grow. The economy grows with productivity, labor growth, and inflation. And I gave you examples and discussions on each one of those. Uh, do define stocks is it's it's equity ownership. You are an owner of the firm and you have limited liabilities. The most you can lose is 100%. So we're getting there. Hopefully you're able to do all of this off the top of your head without having to see this outline. So last class, we got into U.S. versus non-U.S. I showed you this chart, 
how you can distinguish between developed, emerging, and frontier. The U.S. is a developed market, but we, we, we look at the U.S. Remember, there's the U.S., there's international. International would include all developed markets except for the U.S., all emerging markets, all frontier markets. And then global would be everything, including the U.S. So this is how Standing & Poor's distinguish them. I also, on Blackboard, will give you Morgan Stanley, or it's actually not Morgan Stanley anymore. They, they spun off their, their indices group. So it's MSCI which initially the MS was Morgan Stanley, but they've spun it off. It's its own separate company. They have a documentation on how they distinguish U.S. versus non-U.S., but my word, it's, it's, it's hundreds of pages long. It's very, very detailed. I like the as standard and pores because they keep it short and sweet. It's not quite so complex, but the, the term in this is, is, a, is a country developed? Is it emerging? Is it frontier? I just read an economist article today talking about the countries that are moving in and out of these indices like Argentina and Brazil and South Africa, some of these countries that are moving in and out, they're moving from one category to the other. How have these different indices done? In the last several years, the U.S. has been the place to be. The U.S. stock market, even with the big drawdown in COVID, over the last, I don't know how far back it went, it looks like it's five years, five years, the U.S. stock market is up. That 34% that up is not a great up because that's over five years. So it's probably only averaged about 6% a year, but still it's positive. Whereas um, emerging markets and developed markets are, are flat to slightly negative. So the U.S. has definitely been the place to be the last several years. Um, so emerging has been flat. Now I'm reading a lot of articles saying emerging markets is the place to be going forward, mainly because we're seeing somewhat a resurgence, resurgence in commodity prices. And obviously a lot of emerging countries are very tied to commodities, not just energy, but, but other commodities like steel and, and copper and those things that China has become really strong in. So, there is some debate that maybe now is the time to get back in emerging markets, but it hasn't been the place to be the last five years. You would have done a lot better in the U.S. market, but this changes over time. I mentioned productivity. So with productivity, you want to ask, where is productivity improving the most in the world? There's a wonderful uh, Robert Arnott. I mentioned Robert Arnott earlier in the class. There's a wonderful article that he wrote a great research paper. I think he wrote it with a couple other people. But that he argues, where in the world do you want to invest? Where you want to invest where productivity is the strongest? And I like his argument. His argument isn't the strongest in terms of the level of productivity. The U.S., France, Germany, productivity is very, very high. But he says the key is not going to the country with the highest productivity, it's to go to the country with the, with the fastest growing productivity. So it's not the height of the productivity, it's how much it's improving. So you want to go find a, a country whose productivity is getting better and better and better, and that's going to be reflected in their stock prices. And then he makes the argument that productivity is the highest when you have an older workforce. When you have a lot of people in their 40s and 50s and 60s, because these are people highly trained, they got a lot, they have a lot of experience, so their productivity is really high. But the countries with the highest change in productivity, the highest growth in productivity, are going to be going to be those with younger populations, like in Africa and Latin America, where they have younger populations, because younger people, while their productivity may not be that high because they don't have much experience, their productivity is changing the fastest. And so those are the countries you're going to see the fastest growth. So their stock markets should do the best. And he actually goes through several countries around the world and shows you what his model is saying is the best place to be. But you can see with the U.S., in the 90s, we had really strong productivity, well above 2%. And then the first decade of the 2000s, especially with 2008, 2009, productivity was averaging maybe 1.5%. And then the second decade of the 2000s, very, very weak productivity because of the 2008-2009 crisis. We had a strong bounce back, but look at that bounce back. That's only 3%. You know, we were getting up to 5% back in the 90s. And that did not last long. And a lot of this was just coming back 
off of um, off of the major slowdown from the financial crisis. But look at since then, since 2014, productivity has consistently been below below one percent. Now productivity is only one percent, and labor growth is barely half a percent, maybe one percent at a stretch, and inflation is two percent. You're talking about nominal GDP growth of four percent. Remember, President Trump said he was going to get GDP growth of four percent, but he was talking about real GDP growth. That's four percent before inflation. We're not even getting four. We're not even getting four percent GDP growth, including inflation. And so it's just been now employment growth has been strong the last ten years. So that number may be high enough to get you get you a little bit higher, but inflation's been low, productivity's been low, and so we're we're talking real GDP in a one and a half to two percent range, and nominal GDP in a three and a half to five percent range. So GDP economic growth in the U.S. has really weakened, and not just in the U.S. and a lot of a lot of developed world, a lot of Europe. You even see in Australia now one country that just says rarely has had any recessions. I think they had their first recession for 50 years because of COVID-19, but they're actually starting to slow down some a little bit here. So where do you want to invest in the world? Do you want to invest in the world where earnings growth is the strongest? Earnings growth will be the strongest in those countries that are seeing the best improvement in productivity. Now there is a growing trend to breaking these indices up differently. So there are some, instead of saying U.S. large cap, U.S. mid cap, and U.S. small cap, instead just go global. Don't try to, don't say if you're in the U.S. or Europe or wherever, just go global and do global large cap, global mid cap, global small cap. So for, forget location, focus on capitalization. Or there's another one that says some sectors are global and some sectors are regional. So you, you make these combinations so on energy, you do global large cap on energy, but with restaurants, and you do global mid cap, global small cap for energy, but for restaurants, consumer services, you probably want to do US large cap, US mid cap, US small cap, um, UK large cap, mid cap and small cap, Germany, because most consumer services are very much tied to that country and it's hard for them to go over, over borders and grow that way, it's really tough. Um, or you do some kind of combinations. Remember, you want to be parsimonious. We could definitely do U.S. large, mid, and small. Do U.K. large, mid, and small. Do Germany large, mid, and, mid and small. Australia, Canada. We could do that, but boy, we'd end up with so many asset classes. And remember, if we do if we do U.K. as large, mid, and small, we've got to hire. A group, we've got to find a group of managers. We have to have you know at least two or three to choose from in each one of those categories. We want two in each one of these categories. There's six right there just for the UK. And then we had Germany and then France. And then you know it just gets it gets ridiculous. So you're trying to find some combination. So there's a move toward this. What I showed you is still the most common approach. It's US large cap, mid cap, and small cap, breaking it probably between growth and value. And then we get to international, just looking at international as far as developed emerging in frontier. But I have seen a move to doing international, breaking it up between large and small, or even doing global. So just to let you know, when you go out there into the, the actual job market, you will see different combinations than what we've done. What, we, what I've shown you is the most common still, but you'll see other combinations. And the first question you ask is, you know, if you, if you, you got to ask it in a good way. You don't want to embarrass the people that are training you. That's never good. But just ask, uh, probably the worst way to ask is, is say, how do y'all know that this, this number of asset classes is parsimonious? They're going to think you're showing off. A better way to ask it is, well, I took this class and they used the term parsimonious. I didn't know that word before the class, but they were talking about the optimal level of asset classes. And I'm just, I'm wondering what you, your, your group did to come up with that optimal level of asset classes. That's the better way to ask the question. Don't, don't use big words for people that are training you. It just intimidates them and they start looking over, over their shoulder. Um, now you can do a lot more analysis here. So countries that have better regulatory regimes are better. We looked not too long ago about uh, 
ease of doing business, that's certainly a place you can look. We look at that index. There's great books you can read. There's a book by Jen Robert Rogers called Street Smarts. I, I love his approach. He's, he's really big on Asia. And he's so big on Asia, he really believes the 21st century is going to be an Asian story. It's going to be China and Singapore, the Philippines. It's, it's, going, to be, it's going to be an, an Asian story. He's so convinced of it that he actually moved his family to China. Now, we went to China. They, didn't, they did not like China too much. They were in a city that had air quality issues. But he had his daughters. He has two daughters. Uh, he's, he's getting up there in age, but he married someone much younger than himself. And they have two daughters. And his two daughters are fluent in English and in Mandarin. And so he moved his family to Singapore, a country I'd love to a country kind of city state I'd love to visit sometime. It sounds like a really interesting place to live. And he really loves Singapore because it's essentially the hub of a lot of what goes on in Asia. But that's how much he believes in Asia as the growth story. Very much what we're talking about. It's productivity, it's growth, it's demographics, those type of things. Obviously, Asia, especially China, India, have some really serious issues they're dealing with right now. Some of these China entities that are prop up by the government that are very inefficient and China is going to have to deal with that. They also have a heavy debt problem. India has had some problem with just with just uh, regulation and, and corruption and just trying to find a way to let the economy move without all this red tape. Um, but other countries have those issues as well. So the really key is, are they, in, are they improving? Are they getting better? Because that's where you make money in the stock market. A book I do recommend, it's a little bit of a tough read, no, no question. It's a little bit long, but it's a book called Why Nations Fail, The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty. And what they do is they go through the whole analysis of why do some countries turn out well and grow fast and other countries fail. So Argentina is a good example. Argentina was one of the richest countries in the world in the early part of the 20th century, but since then it's just been a disaster after disaster including now they're still just really struggling It's a country that should be wealthy should be doing well but they just can't get it to work and he talks through what is it the nature of that country that has really hampered it versus a country like japan or um, singapore is a good example or hong kong that they have excelled and so he goes through they they actually provide a a argument a template for what you should see for countries that do well, do do well, and the countries that will fail, and it's a very easy template. And then they have this very lengthy book where they prove the template works over and over and over again. So many examples, not just in the last hundred years, but even going back centuries, to show why countries fail at the end. And it's, and he has there's a specific template. Now, if you don't want to go through that lengthy book. The great courses, I don't know if you've ever done any of the great courses, but they're college courses. They're taught by really respected college professors, but without the pressure of grades and papers. They're a little expensive, I think, but they have had some, um, they do have some sales every once in a while where they'll give their courses, sell their courses at a very, very reduced rate. And I've, that's when I've bought some of their courses. They're really good. The ones I've listened to are very, very well done. And, and they go through essentially the same thing as Why Nations Failed. And in fact, uh, one of my former students sent me this. He said, you got to listen to this. And he was telling me about it. And it sounded almost identical to Why Nations Failed. And, and sure enough, this professor uses the Why Nations Failed as a, a basis of a lot of his class. So that I forget how many hours. Maybe it's a 16 hours worth of classes, something along that that line, but something great. If you're exercising, that'd be a good thing to listen to. Get their model, listen to the model, write the model down at some point. You may have to stop running if you're running and listening to it. Stop at one point and jot down their actual model so you have it You have it there. This guy, uh, Sharman from Morgan Stanley, he does some really excellent podcasts and articles. So, I encourage all of these. Here's the three books. There's Jim Rogers himself. Um, he is quite the speaker. I don't know if he, how many podcasts he does. He is on some podcasts. I've seen him on Bloomberg TV where well, he's he they love interviewing him because he's always saying something outlandish. 
he's a he's a very wealthy man and he's up there in age and he just doesn't care anymore so he just speaks his mind here's the sarma he has an, uh, a podcast that he did and then I pulled um, a link to that podcast it's a podcast by Barry Ritholtz so you can look up Barry Ritholtz and Sarman goes the four D's so when Sharma says, how do you figure out where do you want to be around the world? You have to look at these four Ds. He talks about the rise and fall of nations, very similar to the other one. And this is what you're at as a stock investor. Where are you going to put your money in the world? Do you want to go to those countries that are going to succeed? Uh, I've seen, there's about 10 years ago, there's a big push to say that Asia is not the, not the place you want to be for the 21st century. It's Africa. Africa, they have all these resources, they have a young workforce, they're starting to get political uh, uh, corruption taken care of. Now, 10 years later, it's just not happening. There's a lot of struggles. Uh, I've had some former students, I've had some students from Nigeria and just talking to them about the frustration of, of that country and the leadership. And, and it's, it's frustrating, but these countries, they could break out. Africa could be, could be the, the continent of the century. It's interesting to see no one's saying U.S. will be the continent, will be the country of the of this 21st century, but U.S. tends to be the country that tends to always bounce back. But that's what you want to know. Why is it? Why does the U.S. tend to always come back and these other nations, they do well for five or six years and then they fail? So he talks about the four Ds. Depopulation, we're not having as many babies as we used to, so the populations are shrinking. There is an incredible TED Talk. That would, I would strongly recommend. It's a few years old. It's this gentleman right here. So you look for this TED Talk. It's really, really well done. And his, his uh, name is Hal, Hans Ros, Rosling. He does a great job of talking about global populations and where they're going to go. It's a few years old, so maybe he's you know it's well it's a decade old maybe maybe he's done an updated one so you might want to look this one itself i thought was really interesting so it'll be interesting to see if he's done an updated one but this is the kind of material you need as an investor you have to know what's going on in the world is another reason why i so highly recommend that you read the economist every week figure out what's going on in the world listen to these ideas listen to these podcasts listen to these podcasts and try to get a wide variety don't just listen to one thing Get a wide variety here, a lot of people from all the world. That's where you get the investment ideas from. You just want a lot of variety. Depopulation, so that's important. The world is tends to be shrinking. You have countries like Japan that really and truly are shrinking. Deglobalization. Globalization was the big story in the 90s and the first decade of the 2000s. But now we've had, you know, especially President Trump was somewhat of an anti-globalist. Um, Biden's more pro-global, but even he's having acknowledged that China has some issues and he may not be as friendly toward China as, as his previous speeches and positions have implied. But we'll see. It'd be interesting to see. But he says deglobalization. He actually says the U.S. will benefit from deglobalization and it's countries like Germany and the U.K. and others that will be most harmed by deglobalization. Deleveraging, there's way too much debt in the world. And countries are going to have to eventually figure out that they're going to have to pay this debt back, especially if interest rates ever rise. Now, these other things will cause interest rates to stay low. So it's possible deleveraging won't be a crisis overnight. But if interest rates were to shoot up, boy, right now in the U.S., we have a tremendous amount of debt. But treasury interest rates are so low, we just don't notice it. But if treasury interest rates were to go back to their historical norms, while the, the interest expense on the debt would just take over the entire U.S. Uh, budget and we would not have any money for anything else. And then de democratization more and more countries are saying they don't like democracy. Now, I don't know what they say we want to replace it with. I was reading an Economist article. They actually want to move back to a king and, and have royalty. Now, the country didn't have, they did not have uh, democracy they had more of a one ruling party for many, many, many years, but they wanted to go back instead of a pretend democracy, they wanted to go back to a royalty with the king. 
But more and more surveys, especially younger people, are saying democracy is just not working, and there's been big negatives on that. Obviously, what's been happening in the U.S. with our last election isn't giving people in non-democratic countries like Japan much uh, encouragement to move more to more democracy. But that's the four thing. Those are the four things he talks about, and he says, "What does this imply? Which gun? Which countries would do well in this type of a world, and which countries would do poorly?" So I'd highly recommend listen to these things. I'm not saying he's right. It's his opinion, but he's very knowledgeable. He's been managing a lot of money. He's very highly ranked, highly ranking employee at Morgan Stanley. He obviously is having incredibly successful career, so he's definitely worth listening to. I think he also has a book. I think I bought his book on the same thing. So you might look up his name on on Audible Books or on Amazon and, and maybe buy his book as well. All right, so there's U.S. versus non-U.S. stocks. Uh, the key there, as we said, is how fast are the individual countries' economies growing. That's where you want to be. You want to also be worried about their currencies. When you're talking about the economic growth, it's the same thing we talked about, productivity and labor. And inflation as well, but productivity and, and because if inflation is high, yeah, you'll get higher earnings growth, but you're going to get killed in the currency if that happens. And so it really comes down to productivity productivity and labor growth. And that's why, those, and, and I told you that Robert Arnott, he links those two. Labor growth and productivity, young populations with a lot of young workers, like in Africa, Latin, like in parts of the Middle East, Latin America, young populations. So they have a workforce so they can grow their economies because they have the workers and their productivity will be improving because they have young workers that are getting skills, getting training, their productivity will may not be very high, but it's going to improve faster than other countries. So that's the kind of thing you're looking at. And he's saying similar types of things. Population is key to his, but he has some other things in there. So these are the kind of things to listen to and, boy, become, become a, a person who's knowledgeable of the entire world. So that brings us up to our very, very last asset class, and that's alternatives. And that is everything else. And we could really... We could go wild with this. I'm going to give you a much shorter list than others might have just because I don't want to overwhelm you with the alternatives, but I'll, I'll actually mention some other alternatives that could be there besides just the ones I have. But the main reason for alternatives is diversification. Alternatives tend to be low, have low correlation. That tends They tend not to drop when other assets class drop. They tend to be somewhat independent, so they provide some diversification to your portfolio. And then for real assets, real assets is a big part of alternatives, things like real estate and commodities. They also often provide a good hedge against inflation. So that's when you introduce alternatives, make sure you have those two points in there. All alternatives tend to have the argument of diversification. And real assets, those assets that you can touch, you can put your hands on, unlike a stock or a bond, which are just... Uh, just contract contracts, their legal rights. They're not actual something you can touch. Uh, but real assets, real estate, commodities, timber, those tend to give you a hedge against inflation. And we know, like for gold especially, inflation takes off. Gold will do very, very well. That's a real asset. So let's start with real assets. I'm up to page 20 and 21 of the class notes. Real assets is anything that you can touch. Probably the biggest real asset or by far the biggest real asset is real estate. I don't know if we have any real estate majors in our class. It's possible we do, but real estate is definitely a very specialized part of finance. So, so specialized that we actually have we give it its own degree at UTSA. So real estate. What, how does real estate fit into a portfolio? And we struggle with this at USAA. It was interesting. I, I got called into a new department they just had started it was called investment strategy and analysis we called it isa investment strategy and analysis and we started with the property and casualty insurance company and did an investment study for them we spent an entire year working on nothing but that and what we discovered is there had been very there had been very little research on the asset allocation for a property and casualty insurance company the companies that sell auto insurance homeowners insurance commercial liability insurance and so we had to do everything from scratch. 
And so it was, it was a really fun year. We did a lot of deep research. And one of the things we had to research was real estate because USA has a large multi-billion dollar real estate portfolio and very, very few property and casualty companies, if any, in fact, USA is about the only one that has a large real estate portfolio. And most property and casualty companies say we can't have real estate because it's too illiquid. We argued at USA that our liquidity was very good, our net worth was very good. So we have a little bit more room for illiquid assets as long as we don't get, get carried away with it. But we want to ask the question, does real estate really work with our portfolio? And one of the questions we had to answer is, what is the expected return and the expected risk of real estate, and we came to the conclusion that it's somewhere between stocks and bonds. So, now, you could also argue, if you look at the historical da data, you could also argue that, argue that it's low risk and low correlation. And we looked at that and we said, you know what, we don't think that's really true. And the reason we don't think that's true, and we had pretty good evidence for this, is that real estate is not traded on public markets the way bonds and stocks are. So Tesla stock, it can be up 5%, down 6%, up 7%. Real estate's not traded like that. Real estate valuation, returns on real estate are based on appraisals. Now there are some property sales, but there's not a lot of property sales. Real estate doesn't sell like stocks where you have a million shares sharing, trading every day, especially large real estate. It, it takes months to take a huge property, a $100 million property, it's going to take a long time to sell that. And when you get the sell done, that's just one piece of data. You have all this other property you didn't sell. So you have an appraiser come in. They're going to look at rents and do discounted cash flows. And, but their appraisal will be a lot smoother, a lot less volatile than what you see in actual public markets like, real, like, uh, like stocks and bonds. And so we always question, does real estate, is it really low risk and low correlation? And so we decided to put the risk, real estate looked like it had a lower risk than bonds because of that appraisal smoothing. So we decided to make our assumption for real estate that it's somewhere between stocks and bonds. It, it, we, we just did not trust, and we didn't trust the low correlation either because what a lot of people do with real estate, and I saw this at USAA, is they do appraisals first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, but they're, they, they just essentially just update what they did last quarter. And then in the fourth quarter, they do a really deep detailed appraisal and that's where their values change the most so and also they only did things quarterly for stocks and bonds we usually get monthly data but real estate all we have is quarterly data so it's really really tough we are going to we're mainly focused on commercial real estate and in this class we're not going to look at residential at all if you're interested in residential then you know get a real estate finance major and get into the residential real estate. I have a, a former student, excellent, excellent student who's in that market and he's doing quite well selling houses. That's a very different world than what we're talking about here. I'm talking about big multi-million dollar commercial properties. And Naycreef is a good place to go. If you look in Naycreef, they like to divide up property either geographically or by property, property type. Geographic might be Southeast, Northeast, the Midwest, Southwest, the West, the Northwest. So those regions, it separates it. And then property types could be hotel, office, retail, industrial, apartment. I don't know about malls anymore. Malls are dying, but um, those, those are the categories. So there's the only residential real estate we have is apartments, but that's multifamily. So let me show you Nate Creef really, really quickly here. So here's Nate Creef. They have they do have some research. So when you get on in some of these sites, go and look at the research. You may not be able to get access to it because they may they may require you to have membership or to pay a fee. But some Nacreef used to be everything was free and available and they've now made it so you have to pay money to, or be a member to get their data. It's somewhat frustrating. But you can see they have some really good articles. If you're taking a real estate finance class and you need a, some data for an article, this might be a good place to go. Show all you can see they have a lot a lot of data so it's a great place you used to be able to get their data for free and um boy it just they don't you have to subscribe and I, i've tried it and you have to be a, a member so they say our data products are available to nate Creek members only that used not to be the case you used to be able to get 
quarterly returns for NACREF back many, many, many years, and we use that data all the time, but you can't do that anymore. They have a whole section on COVID-19 impact, which obviously has not just a short-term impact on commercial real estate, but could have a very long-term. Obviously, it's, it's crushed hotels, but even office space, more and more people are working from home, and that may be a permanent thing, and there's a lot of people in the real estate world worried about what, what impact that is going to have on, um, on real estate, commercial real estate. Now, there's a special asset called real estate investment trust, and there's also real estate operating companies, so REITs and REOX. This is real estate that's held inside a company that's structured as a stock. So it trades like a stock. And so what they're doing is they're taking something real liquid like real estate and let it be trade daily like a stock. And when this first came out, people were saying, wow, now we can now we can diversify into real estate. This is wonderful. And that was the original argument. There's a mutual fund I used to manage. And before I managed it, I'm glad they fixed it. Before I managed it, it was 25% bonds, 25% stocks, 25% REITs, real estate investment trust, and 25% gold. And oh, that was a horrible fund. I don't know who came up with that allocation. Um, it was just so volatile. And the reason is REITs are really not real estate. REITs are really small company stocks, and that's what they trade like. They have the high volatility like, like, uh, like small company stocks. So when you take an illiquid asset like real estate and you convert it into a daily traded asset, it doesn't look like the original asset. It doesn't pick up the return risk and correlation of those assets. So it's best to classify REITs as a stock, real estate operating companies, REOX as stocks, the Standard & Poor's has broken real estate out into its own category. It's the smallest of all the indices out there. Real estate is huge, but there's a very small percentage of real estate that's actually being held in REITs and REROCs. Most, most real estate is held privately or in, in partnerships. And so even though re, even real estate is huge, it's bigger, as big as or bigger than the bond market and bigger than the stock market, even though that's the case, very little of real estate is actually traded in these public stocks, but even if it were traded, it would change the nature of it. It would make it look more like a stock. It would be very volatile. So, so when you make an illiquid asset liquid, you're going to get daily price discovery, and that's going to change risk and correlations. They're going to be higher. Now, REITs have their own website as well. You can just go to REIT.com. It's, it's known as NAREIT, but their site is REIT.com. They have some background on what is a REIT. They also have some, some data. They may actually provide their data for free, but you can easily get their data from, um, from the Bloomberg machines. Industry news, events, investing in REITs. So NAREIT, the goal of NAREIT is to get people to buy more REIT stocks. They're focused on the stock side. NAREIT actually hired a firm called Ibbotson Associates to do an analysis of REITs and they what they wanted to do is prove that REITs were acting more like real estate than like small caps. Like overnight, suddenly REITs look more like real estate. And we actually had Ibbotson come to USA and talk to us. And sure enough, their data showed that REITs were really starting to act very differently than other small company stocks. And so I thought, wow, that's really interesting. And so I said, well, maybe that's the case. Maybe REITs really have changed. They left. My department, we sat down and we said, well, let's let's check the data. And sure enough, their data was correct up until the point they did the data. But right after their data ended, if you started with the months after that, REITs went right back to looking like small cap. And so they hired this firm and had them go around the entire country arguing that REITs look more like real estate when, in fact, that was just a one-time short window where REITs had an unusual period of time where they looked very different. And, but now, now they're back to just being real estate, just being a small cap, small company stocks. But you can definitely see there's a lot of places that you can get free information. And here, here they do have a lot of places you can link to see what's going on with REITs. So if you're, you are, you are a real estate finance major, NACREF and REIT.com are two places you should probably have linked. Uh, on your favorites, if y'all still do favorites on, on internet, may have the sites down and visit them. See what, see what um, research they're doing.
news articles they have. Give your, get, get, get yourself deep into this industry. So then as I mentioned, real, real, residential real estate does not trade in a public way that you can easily invest in it. It's, it's hard to buy a hundred houses. You can do apartments, but doing individual houses, a lot of firms just don't do that. It's just impossible. You can do the mortgage-backed securities, but you don't have the real estate, you don't have the houses, so you have the debt on the houses. So it's very, very different. So residential real estate is a special class that we're not going to cover in this class. I do know people that that's a big part of their investment portfolio as individuals. They may have managed 10 or 15 houses in San Antonio. Very different world than what we're talking about here. Very different analysis. So I'm, I'm going to skip that for, for us. The second real asset, so we're still under real assets. The second real asset is timber. I'm a big fan of timber. Uh, I think it's just a really interesting asset class. But essentially, it's both real estate and a commodity. We're going to talk about commodities next. But timber, it's real estate. You have land with trees on it. And if you want to sell it as real estate, let's say a hotel wants some of your timber land, you can sell it as, as real estate and, and make real estate invest, investment type returns. Or you can grow the trees and sell it for paper or sell it for construction, hard and soft wood. So timber is, has that wonderful characteristic that it's both a commodity and real estate. So it's interesting, it tends to have good diversification. And the reason for that is this timber tends to be a local market. It's very, very difficult to ship huge trees overseas see the China. It's even difficult to, to truck trees from Canada down to the United States. You can do it some, but it, it tends to be local. So Texas has, you may not realize this, I, I don't think most of the world realizes this. When I talk to people about Texas and other countries, they think Texas is all one big desert and looks like the, um, the cowboy TV shows and movies they saw back in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Don't realize that US, yet Texas has a huge forest in East Texas. And so Texas is a big part of the timber timber industry. Um, so good returns, excellent diversification. And it's one asset that's really unique. It's hard to think of too many other assets. But let's say you're growing trees and you don't like the price of timber. What do you do? You just keep the, you let the key trees keep growing. So not only are you waiting for prices to change, but while you're waiting for prices to change, you have more product. The trees are getting bigger. You might be able to say that with cattle, but there comes a point where you fatten the cow as much as you can and you just can't do it anymore. So, you know, eventually you just have to sell the cow. You can't say that, that with oil, having oil sitting there in the barrels waiting until prices come back. You're not going to end up with more oil at the end. And so the industry calls this storing it on the stump. So let me show you, Hancock is, is my favorite of the uh, timber companies. So I want to show you their website. And of course their website is very, very green. They don't have a picture of them ripping trees out of the ground in a way you should really, you should go to YouTube and look at some of the videos of how they actually take trees up now. There's this machine that just rips it right out of the ground. It's not the lumberjack with the saw anymore. Look how beautiful these pictures are. <laughs> these beautiful trees that they're going to they're going to cut down. But they're obviously focused on green because green is the thing right now. And they actually make the argument that they're actually helping reduce global warming because of how well they manage the growing of trees and replacing the trees. They make sure, because it's not in their best interest, to cut a bunch of trees down all at once. So they make sure there's always a crop of trees growing. Interesting firm. We met with Hancock Timber. I've never had an investment in timber as much as I love timber. One thing I thought was really interesting, and I've had a few students think about this, but let's say you really love the outdoors, but you also love finance, and you're trying to figure out that perfect, perfect uh, career. What I'd recommend, if, if you think timber might be the thing for you, go apply for a job like, like Hancock. I'm sure somewhere in here they have a place where you can, you can apply for jobs and try to get a job there. And if you get a job there, then when you go back for your master's, you don't get an MBA or an MS in finance. You go back and get your, your master's in forestry. And boy, that is an incredible, the guy we talked to, he had a degree in forestry and in finance. 
and he spent most of his time out out in the country in blue jeans. I mean, now you can wear blue jeans to work, but this was back when we were still wearing suits to work. He could go he could go to work in blue jeans four days out of the week, and then one day he had to go visit clients. He had to put a suit on, but he was outdoors a lot. Uh, I I think that'd be a great career. Uh, you'd have to go out and look, and I could help you if you're interested in that. Go out and look for those major timber companies. They're probably not that difficult to find, and and just apply. See if you get a job, get some experience, then go back. And you know, there will probably be wherever their home office is. There will probably be a university nearby that has a forestry master's program. So I mean, there's some interesting careers. I've had a few students talk about combining finance with a law degree. And there's a lot of careers you can do with that, but there's other things. So again, the you know, one thing I always tell students, it's probably best not to get your master's right after your undergraduate. Get out there, get some experience, figure out what you like, figure out where you're gonna specialize, and then start talking about your master's. This is a perfect example. Combining finance with forestry could be an incredible career that could be an entire 50, next 50 years of your life. Your friends may hate you if you tell them you cut down trees for a living, but you, you will have the green story, and they have a good green story to tell you here on the other side. So interesting field. If you want to get more into timber, there is a firm called GMO. Uh, GMO, if you go to GMO.com and look them up, they, they're big proponents of timber. They do stocks and bonds and everything else. But timber is an asset class that they have been really pushing heavily the last several years, and they have research on it. They have some really good research. You do have to register to use their site, but once you register, there's no cost or anything, and they don't really sell and send any emails. You just have to log in. And they have tremendously great research, and one of their research will be on timber. So there's great places you can go and read, in addition to their site here, Hancock site. All right, the last real asset, we'll, well, not the last, we'll, we'll talk about a, a bunch of other smaller ones, but the last major one we'll talk about is commodities. So commodities, they have all different levels of risk, they have all different correlations, but the reason commodities can be a good diversifier is commodities tend, unlike stocks and bonds, commodities tend to have super cycles where 10 years, 15 years, things go on. So we had a big super cycle in um, metals because of China. So we saw because of China growing and, and going throughout the 2000s and even, even since, but really up until 2008, fast growth in China was causing copper prices, concrete prices, steel prices to just skyrocket. And it was a very, very long cycle. We've seen very, very long cycles with gold. So when the world's worried about inflation, gold has a great cycle. When the world is not worried about inflation, like in the 80s and 90s, gold just does horribly. So you see these super cycles, and these super cycles are in, interposed on the shorter cycles stocks and bonds go through. And so commodities can provide a really good long-term diversification. So it includes energy, agriculture, metals. Finviz.com is another site I highly recommend you go check out. It's a really, really great site. When you come in, they have this wonderful graph where they show all the all the stocks in the, in the S&P 500 and how they've done. They show which stocks have moved the fast the most, what has the most volume. But up here at the top, they have this button called Futures. And if you click on that, they bring up the Futures after you get through all their I ads. I'm sorry, they have a horrible number of ads. Their pop-ups are some of the worst. But... They have the stock indices at the top. They have the bond indices. So stocks and bonds, they have the VIX. We might talk about the VIX a bit later. But then you start getting into the commodities. So these are not commodities. These are stocks and bonds. So there's, there's the bonds there. But here's the commodities. Energy, oil, you got West Texas, and you got Brent. Gasoline, heating oil, natural gas. I just saw that liquefied natural gas has been skyrocketing. Ethanol. And then you get into the agriculture ones, the soft commodities, cocoa, cotton, orange juice, coffee. Coffee is one I'm really interested in. You can, you can see coffee prices have come up here recently. Timber, we're just talking about timber. Timber prices have been down here recently, but they were doing really well at the end of 20, 
2020, and you can actually click on these. I'll come back and click on them. Sugar, sugar has been a big issue in some countries because of supply and demand issues with COVID. Then you get into your metals, gold, silver, platinum, copper, palladium. Then you get into your cattle, live cattle, feeder cattle, lean hogs, more agricultural, soybeans, a bunch of soybeans, corn, wheat, rough rice, oats, canola. Then currencies. Currencies are not a commodity, so they don't belong to it. Here's your commodities, this middle section. So let's look at timber. We were just talking about timber. So bring in timber. It's It did well at going coming out of COVID-19. Then it sold off. I don't know why. And then it's had a rise and it sold off. But you can actually click here where it says monthly and get a much, much longer picture. And you can see there's a general rise here. We know timber probably did badly in the 2008-2009 standpoint because of housing coming down. But you can see these high rises and big falls. So you can see in years when the stock market did well, that timber did ter terribly. In a year where stock market has done horribly, timber has done really well. So that's that diversification benefit I'm talking about. But these are these are charts that you can create for other classes that you can you can do five minutes and look at what's just happened recently. You can do longer term. These are some of the charts that I will actually for paper for paper one. When you do paper one, I'll actually take some of these charts and save them. But you might want to go to the site right when you're getting on the day that the unemployment the unemployment report comes out and get this data. You're probably watching this video after that's already happened, so it's too late for me to be telling you that. So if it's already after the fact, then this is where I got the data. You can get really great monthly, weekly, daily. You can get all different all different time spans and spans and just copy it in. Now you can buy a commodity of a basket of commodities. We'll talk about that more when we talk about ETFs, exchange traded funds. There's two big ones, and I give you the link to these two bigger ones, but they're very, very different. There's an S&P GSCI commodity index. I think the C stands for commodity. It's 60% energy, so obviously it's done really horribly the last couple of years. And then there's the Dow Jones AIG commodity index. It's only 31% energy. And so which one you pick is huge. It's very, very important. So here's the GSCI one. You can get all kinds of information on them. Down here, I clicked on sector. They have geography, but sector is probably more important. You can see energy. Now energy, I said 60%. You can see how much the drop in energy, energy is falling from 60% of the index all the way down to 52. I don't know which one's come back up. I didn't capture this back when I last did it, but energy has fallen so much, but it's still over half of the index. Then you go to the AIG one, and here's theirs. It's only 31% energy. You can see how it's spread with the others. You might be interested in, in the allocation of the gold. So it's 11% the gold. Here, I don't know if they break this up or not. It doesn't look like they do, so we can't get any more detail. I don't know what percentage gold is, but you can see total precious metals is only 6%. Whereas here, gold is 11%. Now, silver, silver is an interesting. Silver is a precious metal. However, unlike gold, silver is also a production metal. So gold does well when inflation is a problem, and gold does well when there's a crisis. Silver may not do that. You might. One thing you could really do if you're interested in this is go back and get historical gold prices and historical silver prices and run some correlations, but do that over time. Look at five-year periods and see how the relationship between silver and gold changes. I think silver, you'll find, does really badly in a recession, whereas gold might hand, hold up okay in a recession. So silver somewhat belongs both in the precious and industrial metals because it's both a precious metal and it's also industrial metal. And here you can see copper 7%, aluminum, zinc, zinc, nickel, so 17%. They've got a really heavy allocation to metals. So you can look at all these weights. Um, I don't know why they go out so many decimal places, really bizarre. So energy is the largest 
And look at that, it's pretty interesting, natural gas, 8%. Now it's not the largest because they have 15%, really more than that in, in oil and gasoline. So if you look at it, it's 8% natural gas and the others are tied to, to oil. But, and these are all numbers. That may be why this is still 31%, so it's all numbers. I'm sure they must update it, but um, I haven't gone back to their site to see, so you can go back and look and see um, if you can find more data on this. All right, so those are commodities. How do you get in commodities? If you want to specifically get into energy, you can buy those. We're going to talk about futures later. Futures is an easy way to get into energy. You can buy energy futures. You can buy futures on, on most of these, or you can go buy an ETF. And these ETFs are probably using futures to create their indices. They're not actually going out and buying barrels of oil and blocks of gold, although some of them do. Some of them do actually buy some of these commodities, but most of them probably use the futures market. Now, others, what others are there? Artwork, collectibles, stamps, that can be one. I'll show you, I'll show you, um, well, here's an index that shows you, it's called the Passion Index. I don't remember, I couldn't find this updated anywhere, but this is since 2005 and I don't know what year it goes through. They didn't mark it very, very well, but I, I, I want to more ignore the numbers because I really don't know the period. This might be five years or something, or maybe it's 15 years. So this 90% is probably not all that great because it's spread over many, many years, but they have art, impressionist art, old masters, Contemporary, traditional, fine wine, traditional Chinese art, fine wine, wine is one, stamps, coins. I have a former student, he's on Facebook with me now, and he collects coins and he knows them extremely well, very interesting. Classic cars, rugs and carpets, musical instruments, jewelry, watches, properties, ultra prime properties, that's probably a special type of classic homes. And so prime excluding this right here, which doesn't make much difference because it's pretty small. They don't tell you the percentage each one of these is in their index, but they do have an index. But yeah, there's, there's a way to look at that. This article I gave you is also pretty dated, but it's an economist article that goes a little bit more detail on, on this. So what else could be an other? You see all, I mean, it gets down. So this, this is very specialized. Uh, if you're going to do this area, you better have some expertise in these areas. Bitcoins, I can't speak to that. I still haven't quite figured them out. I've read several articles on them. We have some experts. There was a, uh, one of our alums who graduated just about a year ago. He was an expert on Bitcoin, such an expert. Uh, he went to a, a luncheon where, where the, the speaker was an expert on Bitcoins, and he couldn't answer any questions. So actually, this UTSA student, started answering all the questions because he knew more than the speakers. So he, he had done his homework, but it's tough. There are other things. One, one really cool one right now is called infrastructure. You might look that up, infrastructure as an investment. A lot of countries are privatizing toll, toll roads and airports and those type of things and actually selling it to the, to the, to, to the private market for firms that, to make money off of them. And that's infrastructure and infrastructure is obviously a huge area right now for governments are talking about, especially in the United States, needing to do more infrastructure spending. So that can certainly be one. So th there are other alternative investments out there that I haven't, haven't covered. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a wide field. The key here is you better have the expertise. The, it's very expensive. Trading is very expensive. The auction houses that, that handle these type of items they, they pick up a huge chunk. You know, we talk about trading stocks, it almost costs a zero now. Well, some of these that you're trading, it might cost you 10% just to do a trade. So it's not something you're gonna buy and sell week after week. You're going to hold on to it for many, many years. And then you have something that's valuable that you gotta worry about insurance and fire and those type of things. So you better know what you're doing, but we have had some UTSA students who are experts in these areas. All right, so we'll stop there, and next next time we'll start with venture capital, and that'll be our last of our alternatives. And then definitely next class, we'll get into the tactical asset allocation aspects of how do we take all of this information that we've learned 
and actually apply it to a real life situation.